this episode, we're going to cover wages and gifts. Here we go. All right, in this episode, we're going to delve into Romans, chapters 1 through 6. So we're going to cover all six chapters here. I'm going to try and get everything in that I feel I need to. So I'm going to do a little bit of cramming here, possibly, but I'm going to try and cover everything that I want to. First of all, remember that this is an epistle that was written later on in Paul's ministry. So he's developed a lot of what he needs to write about at this point. And many people believe that this is his most theologically rich epistle. It's as if he has kind of developed his spiel, right? He has been preaching about these things for a long time to a lot of different people and always first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles everywhere he goes. So he has to keep both of those audiences in mind constantly. But here in Romans, he starts off by saying the following. And I love the way that he addresses this. He says, first, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So in other words, set apart. So, hey, this is me. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he's declaring his authority. And then he says what we hear oftentimes throughout all the New Testament, a very key point here which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, talking about Jesus Christ. So again, the prophets have all declared that Jesus is the Christ, or that the Christ is coming and Jesus is the Christ. And then number three here, in verse three, he states something very important, something that we've gone over quite a bit here, and that is temple imagery and drama. This is what he says. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. This is something very interesting. So he's using the title the son here is what he starts off with. And if you have your scriptures with you, look at verse 3. Concerning, it starts off concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. In the original Greek texts, Jesus Christ our Lord does not exist. It's not there. It was put in later on. So none of the early Greek texts that we have have Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's simply read, concerning his son, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. This goes right to our point about Jesus being Jehovah, who was the incarnation, the fruition of the character that was played by the king of Jerusalem that entered into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, and was born out of the Holy of Holies through the veil as the Son of God. So here Paul is tying Jesus as not just the Messiah, but as the Son of God that was foretold by all the prophets and that we had this temple drama about in ancient Israel, in ancient Judah, as a ritual telling us the story about how Jehovah would be born of a woman into mortality and then be the suffering servant, as we hear about in Isaiah. And then we get something really interesting in verse 5 from Joseph Smith. And this is crucial to all of the epistles of Paul as we work through faith, works, and grace. Verse 5 says, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Very difficult to understand this verse. So let's go to the JST here and see what he has to say. Very important. He says it this way, by whom we have received grace and apostleship through obedience. So they've received grace through obedience and faith in his name to preach the gospel among all nations, among whom ye also are called of Jesus Christ. Right, much clearer there. I think it's really important to understand something. And I've, I've seen this, I don't usually do this, but I've gone onto Facebook and a few other places and seen some blog posts and things about this week's lesson. 
because I wanted to see what everyone's talking about because there's always this hoopla over works versus grace and, and all these things. It's not just between the Protestants and the Mormons. It's within the Mormon church as well. You have people that seem to be a little bit more open and liberal that really want to push the grace narrative. And you have those that are a little bit more closed off and, and conservative that seem to really want to more, push more the work side of things and the judgment side of things. Well, they're both right. And that's what Joseph Smith is saying here. So as we hear faith and works and grace, well, let's listen to what Joseph Smith says. Through obedience and faith in his name. Now, faith in his name means trust. That's my definition. Trust in the atoning sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's where we get the grace. It's both sides. And Joseph Smith, I believe, definitely wants us to understand that. You can just see Joseph Smith's mind turning and the inspiration and the spirit hitting him as he goes through these epistles that are so difficult to understand. And you've got all these components of the spiritual economy floating around here, and yet this young guy, uneducated guy, goes through this, and right away he spots this in Romans 1. And he tells us it's through obedience and faith. And those are the two areas here at the beginning of Romans that we have Paul focusing on. Obedience with works, those are the lower law, and faith in the grace and mercy and atonement of Jesus Christ. Those are the two things he focuses on here. That's the lower and the higher laws. You have to have both. And again, another thing I need to make clear here from our last episode is that even though the law here typically refers to the law of Moses, and it definitely does, it is a reference to what is known to the Jews at this time. So, of course, they understand every, their whole world about the law of God is the law of Moses. But it's not to us. And it's not to the Gentiles. There is a law of God that is based on truth and that has consequences. And that's how we sin. Whether you are Jew or Gentile, that's how we sin. And he's going to go over that a little bit more here. Then I want to move down to verse 16 and 17. This is the crux of the epistle of Romans. This is what it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, when we hear gospel here, for us, what we understand is the entirety of the teachings and the truth about the plan of salvation, about the commandments, about purpose, about principles. And that is all true. But to Paul at this time, just like to him the law he really is going to focus on the law of Moses, even though there's a broader meaning to law and works than that. When he says gospel, even though there's a broader meaning, he's talking about originally what that means, which is God spell or good spell or good news. It's an old English word that, is, that ends up being gospel. And the good news is that Jesus suffered in Gethsemane for you, and then rose again from the dead, from the sepulcher, with the resurrection. That's the gospel. So when he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, his focus really is on the atonement and on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is really the higher law that he's talking about. That's important to keep in mind as we go through this. And he continues, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So the higher law, the good news is the power of God unto salvation. You have to have that. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So again, he's making sure he's encompassing both audiences here. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So righteousness here is equated with faith. Follow, follow me on this. We're going to continue with that. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So to be justified, as we talked about in the last episode, to be reconciled with God 
you must live by faith. Works is not enough. That's what they're saying. That's what he's leading into. You have to have faith in the good news, in the gospel, in the atonement, and the resurrection. Here in chapter 2, we're going to skip down to verse 6, and we're going to get more about works. It says here, who will, this is God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. So there are consequences. Let's just keep grace to the side here for a minute. There are consequences to decisions, and there are consequences to our actions, both on earth and in heaven. The biggest consequence, of course, is what are we becoming because of our thoughts and our deeds, our works. Different from the other Christian sects out there, this is a core doctrine and a core part of what we believe as the spiritual economy. So as we've got these three major components here of faith, works, and grace, one thing that is left out in the majority of Christianity is what are we becoming? And for us, we know that that is crucial and that that is the primary focus of the plan. And it's our primary purpose. And so the only way that we're going to grow through experience is through our agency and through what we think and what we do. So God is going to render to us according to our deeds. So here again, Paul is actually going in and talking about how important works are for our ultimate destination. And he says here in verse 7, following up with that, he says, To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. That's the end result. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. So you have eternal life on one hand, you have indignation and wrath on the other. Our choices and our works matter. Just as Joseph Smith pointed out in the last chapter, you have to have both. You have to have your works and your obedience on one hand, and you have to have your faith and the grace of God on the other. The lower law and the higher law brought together. And then Paul is always mindful to include both audiences in all of this. He's saying, look, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew, it doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. He's going to give a great example of this here in a minute. But if you're doing evil, you're going to have indignation and wrath. If you're doing good, then you're going to have eternal life. And then he brings up the law here. So again, he's primarily talking about the law of Moses. So this is kind of like if I'm going to another culture as a missionary, I'm going to talk in terms of what they understand. Paul naturally is going to do that because he's part of this doctrine in this culture, at least with the Jews he's speaking with with the law of Moses. But overall, underlying this law of Moses here, there is always a law of God that has always existed. So obedience and works, even though a lot of the works that he talks about here are speaking about the works that go along with the law of Moses, it doesn't matter. I've seen that a lot put out there, that the works are just the law of Moses and the rituals, and the law is just the law of Moses. And that grace is just this relationship that God has as a favor or as the Godfather, as we spoke about. But that isn't true. And you know how I know that? Because of what Joseph Smith has said and what he's going to be going through in these letters. You'll see where he specifically has a pattern of what is meant. And number two on that is the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon gives us a very clear understanding of faith, works, and grace. He says in verse 11, for there is no respect of persons with God. So again, Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. He's going to push this, push this, push this, especially for the Jews. They've got to understand this. It's going to be pretty hard for them. I mean, really, it would be really hard for them to accept this. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. So in other words, they're going to die without the law or the consequences of the law. Right? And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. 
Okay, this goes right back to what I have said before. The best example of this is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. How do you gain a knowledge of good and evil? Because the law is given to you. Now that's not all the tree represents, but it's one of the few major meanings of what the tree of knowledge of good and evil represents. And it's not just the law of Moses. At least in the story there, Adam and Eve don't have the law of Moses. They have other laws. They have part of the law of God and then much more of the law of God later on. But they do have the consequences once they are given each of these parts of the law. And of course they need to partake of the fruit because they need the law, because they need the good works. Even though there's the huge risk of failing, even though there's the huge risk of sinning, they at least need the opportunity for good works. Now, they're not going to make it. We know they're not going to make it. But, of course, a Savior is provided for them so that they can. And so speaking of the Jew and the Gentile, down in verse 25, he says, For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So in other words, speaking to the Jews in their language and their understanding, being circumcised or being committed in covenant to God means nothing if you're not living by faith in Jesus Christ. And it means nothing if you don't keep the law, which nobody can do. So he follows up in the last verse in verse 29 and he says, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. So in other words, the one who is a Jew or a, a person who is in the covenant is someone who has a circumcision of heart. All right, then over in chapter 3, we get more about the Jew and the Gentile and the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And again, just Paul trying to go over this over and over again, that it doesn't matter if you're circumcised. It doesn't matter if you are a Jew. It doesn't matter if you are a Gentile. You have to live by faith. You have to have not only your works, but you have to have faith and live the commandments and have faith in Jesus Christ. He comes down here in verse 20 and bolsters that up a little bit. He's been talking about deeds and works and how we have to have that for eternal life. And now he moves on from there here. And in verse 20 he says, Therefore by the deeds of the law, which he has been speaking of, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So again, justified is that reconciliation with God. In other words, you can't have salvation just by your own deeds. It's impossible. You can't earn your way there. That doesn't mean your deeds aren't important. They're crucial, especially in who you are becoming. And to keep your covenants that you've made, how do you reconcile yourself with God if you're not keeping the covenants? So he follows up with this and says, For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Think of the tree, right? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And then he follows up, and this gets a little bit tricky here. So if you have your scriptures, follow along with me, all right? 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. That doesn't mean that the law doesn't matter anymore and that your works don't matter anymore. It means that the righteousness of God, and that word righteousness, it doesn't show you in here, but righteousness is akin to mercy and grace. It's very, very close. And in fact, a lot of the words in Greek and Hebrew that are used are interchangeable with those words. So the righteousness of, of God, or the mercy of God, or the grace of God, it's not exactly the same, but it's close. Without the law is manifested. So above and beyond the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So again, Jews, above and beyond the law that you're following, the law of Moses here, and the works and rituals, the righteousness of God, the grace of God, being justified completely is only doable beyond the law, beyond obedience, beyond your works. 
And all of the prophets have prophesied of this and taught this. And you can see uh, in many teachings the idea of mercy in the Old Testament and in some of the writings of the Jews in around this time. And he says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the law and your works, because those are in place, you're going to sin. And you're going to fall short of the glory of God. Now, we get this idea sometimes of, well, God is going to make up the difference. So we have to keep going as far as we can, and God will make up the difference. That doesn't really apply properly. I, it kind of works. I know there's been a lot of people that have talked against that. I don't think it matters, honestly, in a practical sense. We should all try our best regardless. I think the point here is, is that we can't get there by obedience. We can't get there by the law alone. In other words, think of the law as a manual of life, a manual of returning to our Heavenly Father and becoming like Him. But you can't follow it. <laughs> You're not good enough to follow it because you have this variable in place that's crucial to who you are, which is called free agency. And you're going to fall short. So because of that, you are covered. Right? That's Yom Kippur. That's the Day of Atonement. Because of that, your sins, where you fall short, are covered if you're exercising your faith and repentance and baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost and the ordinances of the priesthood and the temple. And 24 says something interesting here. It says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean we don't have to have good works. And that's where Protestants, especially evangelicals, are focused on. And that's the problem that we have with it. That is not what the Book of Mormon teaches. That is not what Joseph Smith taught. And that makes no sense to us that you don't have to have a, an obedient, righteous life to grow and progress and to become like Heavenly Father and end up where you want to end up. But it is free in the sense that we don't earn it. We never earned receiving His grace or His sacrifice. That is an absolute gift. But it's not a gift of salvation. It's a gift of opportunity. And there's a big difference. And in 28 he says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified. So that reconciliation is by faith. So not works, but by faith without the deeds of the law. In other words, it's above and beyond our works that justification actually can happen. But we need both. Our choices matter. And he basically says that in the last verse of the chapter in 31. He says, do we then make void the law through faith? In other words, why do we need commandments then? Because we can just have faith in the atonement. But he says, God forbid. I think that uh, Thomas Wayman's translation, he uses, uh, heck no. <laughs> I guess that would be a good translation for Latter-day Saints. I think that's the name of his, his book. But it's, I think he says, uh, certainly not. Certainly not. Yea, we establish the law. So in other words, faith in Jesus Christ and in the sacri his sacrifice and resurrection does not void out our deeds, but helps establish them. What are they for? Why do we have them? What is the purpose? Think of Moses 139. What is the purpose of God? Well, we can't get there without our agency. And we certainly can't get there without the Savior. All right, then in chapter 4, he brings it home here, basically. And he goes through the example of Abraham. And so here with the Jews especially, with Abraham as one of their icons, basically Abraham and Moses. But Abraham is the father of their nation. He's going to open this up a little bit and say, well... He's not just the father of your nation. He's the father of all nations. And so what he does in, in just a magical way here, he brings together the works of the law and the faith of grace and the atonement. 
along with the Jew and the Gentile. He brings all of that together here through the example of Abraham. It's fabulous. He says here in, in chapter 4, and he's focusing on, Paul is focusing on Genesis 15 here, if you ever want to go back and read that. But in chapter 4 here, he starts off with this in verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, have found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath wherefore to glory, but not before God. In other words, Abraham accomplished an immense amount. But, he, but before God, it's not enough. It's not going to do the trick. He could be boasting all day long around you and I. It's not going to do him any good. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So there's the word righteousness again, which has to do with the higher law, not with the law of Moses, not with works and deeds. So his belief in God, or really what we're talking about here, is his faith. And he clarifies this more later on is his faith in Jesus Christ. And this is a direct tie to Jehovah being Jesus Christ here. Because this is the example he's giving. He's talking about faith in Jesus Christ. And here he's bringing up God or Jehovah and the faith in him that is what saves Abraham. It's the same person. It's the same being that he's talking about here. Jesus Christ is Jehovah. And then he asks the question here in his letter. He says, Cometh this blessedness of God then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also, or those that are uncircumcised? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So, again, where we said belief, there he brings up and clarifies it here, that faith is reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Faith in God. Faith in Jesus Christ. Well, anybody can have faith in Jesus Christ. And then he says, well, when was this reckoned to Abraham? When he was in circumcision, or after he'd been circumcised, or in uncircumcision, before he was circumcised? And he says, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So in other words, before he was in that covenant, or what defines Israel in a sense, is when the righteousness was counted toward him. In other words, before he is, so to speak, an Israelite in that sense, or before he's part of the covenant people. So that's why it applies to all of the Gentiles, is what he is saying. And there's a lot backing this up. In our doctrine, we talk all the time about being adopted into the house of Israel. Well, Paul's argument here is that the higher law, that faith in the atonement, applies to all nations regardless of descent, regardless of the covenant originally that was made with Israel. It applies to everybody, and he's showing us why. And then he says this, and this goes right along with the higher law, with the new covenant, with the new and everlasting covenant, which we also call the Abrahamic covenant. This is a great verse right here in 13. It says, For the promise, and that's the oath of the oath and covenant of the priesthood, by the way. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Well, of course it is, because that is part of the Melchizedek priesthood because that is part of the higher law, the new and everlasting covenant. And that applies to everybody, including the Gentiles. Amazing how all that fits in together here for Joseph Smith, isn't it? And then he follows that up by saying, For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Which is true, which is the way they have been living with just a lower law. And he says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, or the higher law. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, or the Jews, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. What a bold, massive statement he just made. And what a, 
What a brilliant argument he's laid out here. And it's tied directly to truth. Of course, it's the gospel. And we know that this is true in the church because we know about the new and everlasting covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, which is what Paul here, as he brings in the new covenant and the restoration of the fullness of the gospel and the priesthood, is revealing to everybody. And then, of course, what he says here is just confirming Scripture in 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. And of course we're told that in Genesis and in many other scriptures. He's not just the father of Israel. He's the father of the nations. That's what Gentiles means, is the nations. Now again, what's interesting here is in verse 16, Joseph Smith comes through again and he wants to clarify something. He's reinforcing it. So where 16 has... In speaking of justification, it says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. It is. But what does Joseph Smith tell us? Therefore ye are justified of faith and works through grace. So it is grace that ultimately justifies you or gives you the righteousness, gives you the gift, reconciles you with God. It's His end of what he did, of the covenant that was free as an opportunity to all of us and that ultimately gets us reconciled with him. But it is both faith and works, faith in Jesus Christ and works through grace that gets us to a point of justification or salvation. So there's a pattern building here with Joseph Smith. He believes in the lower and the higher laws, of course. And then he follows through with this incredible example of Abraham through patience and through faith waiting for the birth of Isaac. He says here in verse 19, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. They're ancient at this point but they don't lose their faith, their trust in God. And it's that trust in God that ultimately gives him his children, all of us. It's fascinating to me. Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes and all of us that are either mixed in blood to Israel or adopted in to Israel this all comes about through the faith of Abraham and Sarah in the promise that God made to them that they would have a child, even against all the odds. And it's the faith they have that creates that. It's not the works or the obedience or anything else, even though that's all important. Ultimately, it's their faith in God and their trust that was counted to him for righteousness and that ultimately gave them Isaac. And then he talks about becoming here in, verse, in chapter 5. Again, this is another crucial part about our understanding of the spiritual economy and the plan of salvation. The major component of us understanding what our purpose is and who we really are. And he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Again, it's our faith that accesses the grace of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. <laughs> not always. But we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worked, worketh patience. And patience experience or character and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So it's not just about what we spoke about in the last episode of that, the Godfather relationship. It's not just about receiving favor and being in the good graces of God, because we're pledging allegiance to Him. 
That's important. That's a good nuance. That's a good context in understanding faith on our end and grace on his end. But it's not enough. It leaves all of this out of the equation. Our growth through patience and tribulation and our character and our purpose and the purpose of God. And that is why I said in the last episode that ultimately we've got, again, my opinion here, but ultimately I believe we have got to look at faith as trust. That's where the growth happens. And that's the relationship I believe that the Lord wants with us. It's not just a matter of being having allegiance to him, which is crucial. And obedience is crucial, but it's not, it's not really enough. We need to have faith. That's what, we're, what Paul is telling us here. The works and the deeds, the obedience, all those things of the lower law have to be there. And they're very, very important. But you must ultimately have faith and learn to have trust as Abraham and Sarah did. And then down at the bottom of chapter 5 and verse 18, I like what is brought up here. I'm really big on the individual and individualism. I don't mean that in a prideful sense and looking at oneself. I mean that in a sense of agency and an understanding that we are not first and foremost part of a collective, of a group. We first are an individual. Chapter or verse 18 says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That would be Adam. Even so, by the righteous of, righteousness of one, that's Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So there's the two sides. There's the sins. Well, we're talking about agency, obedience, falling short, sin, the law. That's Adam. That's us. We are Adam and Eve. In, in many cases, I won't go into this now, but in many cases, literally, we are Adam and Eve. And then on the other side here, we have the free gift from Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. Those two together bring us eventually justification as Joseph Smith has said a couple times here already in these chapters. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So the decisions, the agency of the individuals can have a, a, a large effect on many, many people. So each of us is Adam trying to be more like Christ understanding that we have a potential to grow and to learn. And though we're not perfect, we can strive to become more like the one who was obedient and who made a, how do you, how do you say this without understating it, but made a massive difference for all of us. We each have that ability, not to the same scale, but we, the principle applies to all of us. We can all, as individuals, make decisions that can bring others down. Or we can decide to make decisions that lift people up and have a positive influence on people's lives. And then lastly, here in chapter 6, we talk about baptism. And basically what Paul goes through here is that we not only live in Christ through a baptism and that representation of what baptism is, but we die with Christ. And that's part of the understanding of getting baptized and I would say of repentance at any time in our life. So as we go down into the water, that would represent the crucifixion and death of Christ going into the sepulcher. And then as we're lifted up out of the water, it would represent his resurrection. And so what Paul is stating here is that we are leaving the old man or woman behind, our old self behind, and we're being born again as a new creature that is more like the Savior. And that what we do is we die with our sins, right? We die unto sin and then we live unto Jesus Christ. And lastly, in the last verse here, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. So decisions matter. But the gift of God 
not his wages. It's not what's being earned here. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is the message of Paul here at the beginning of Romans. That works are simply wages. We receive wages for those. And ultimately, with the law that we're not going to follow perfectly, that is a wage unto sin and to death. But there is a gift, which is grace, but that it's free and it's purely out of love. And interestingly enough, that love is demonstrated through suffering and through bearing our burdens and also victory over everything. And so Paul here again is working those components of the spiritual economy trying to get these points across to the Jews and to the Gentiles. That the gospel is for everyone. That having faith in now a resurrected Jesus Christ, that anybody can do that. And that faith, that belief, as it develops and grows, creates character and helps you become something more, a new creature, something more like the Savior. And that baptism is an example of that. And that faith is not just committing an allegiance to someone. It's a good way to look at it so that we get more context into each of these components of the spiritual economy. But faith is trust. Faith is growth for each of us. And works, as Joseph Smith points out and Paul points out, are crucial. Our decisions matter. But we don't live by that alone. And ultimately, it's the gift of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God that reconciles us to Him and gives us the opportunity to grow and to become like Him and to return to Him. Faith, works, and grace, the lower and the higher law, the Jews and the Gentiles. Paul is teaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ and the principles and doctrines that were given to us through Joseph Smith, the new and everlasting covenant or the Abrahamic covenant. Isn't it interesting that Joseph Smith provided us with two additional books? One was Moses. We can look at the law of Moses with him. And one was Abraham, who was already righteous but was searching for more righteousness. We can't always make all of the puzzle pieces fit together, but we can make a lot of them fit together because there is a whole truth, and Paul knows it. I'll talk to you next time.